so first I want to apologize just for being a few minutes late. Uh, it's very busy and we, uh, but we're happy to be here to give you a bit of an update. Um, my name is Kim McKechnie. I am the uh, Vice President of Community Engagement and Communications for the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Um, given the rapidly changing nature of the situation, uh, we recognize that you've had many specific questions about the Saskatchewan Health Authority's response to COVID-19 and our preparedness planning. And we really appreciate your patience uh, over uh, the last week as we've, uh, you know, uh, been doing the work needed to uh, respond to the situation. As many of you are aware, the Saskatchewan Health Authority activated a provincial emergency operations centre based in Saskatoon, which is supporting preparedness planning and response activation across the province with the goal to ensure an effective and coordinated response to the evolving public health situation with COVID-19. The EOC is in place uh, to monitor the evolving situation, to coordinate planning activities between SHA departments and our partner organizations, and managing SHA and system uh, responses to any confirmed and potential cases in the province. So we know many of you had questions and we really appreciate your patience. We've asked today for some of the people who are hard at work uh, addressing the COVID-19 situation to step away from their work for a moment to provide this opportunity for you to uh, ask them questions, obviously in your critical role uh, in the media of helping us inform the public. So I have here with me today, farthest to my left, uh, Derek Miller, Derek Miller, Saskatchewan Health Authority's current site command lead for our emergency operations center, as well as uh, Dr. Julie Krizanowski, uh, SHA's senior medical health officer, and Dr. Susan Shaw, our chief medical officer. And they'll be available to answer questions. We're going to start. So we're going to we're going to start with some comments from Dr. Shaw, followed by comments from Dr. Krasinowski, and then we'll take your questions. So I'll hand it off to Dr. Shaw. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming today. We have seen a rapid change in our world over the last 48 hours, and I recognize that it can be overwhelming at times. What I want to share with you, though, is that despite this fast pace of change, for those of us who work in healthcare, this is what we prepare for every day, ensuring that we are ready and able to adapt to be able to provide care when events like this occur. Pandemic planning is part of what we do across the health sector. We create plans that remain in place and we have processes to review and update procedures as required at different points in time. Since October of 2019, the Saskatchewan Health Authority, along with the Ministry of Health, has been refining and updating what is our current pandemic plan. These plans outline what we would do in a pre-pandemic, in a pandemic, and a post-pandemic situation. What occurred over our last two months is a shift from a hypothetical scenario to actual pandemic, a hypothetical scenario of pandemic planning to an actual adaptation of active plans in relation to COVID-19. And using the lens of what we know about this virus and using the learnings of other countries to adapt and activate various aspects of the pandemic plan. It's very similar to what we've done in the past when monitoring and preparing for other viruses, such as H1N1 in 2009 and Ebola in 2014. Fortunately, this time we have the benefit of a single health authority, and with that, a more effective way to coordinate and manage the response across our system, given the unpredictable and ever-changing na uh, nature of this pandemic. It's allowing us to respond in real time to what is unfolding with COVID-19, shifting supplies and resources where we need it and when we need it. The SHA is taking on a three-pronged approach to COVID-19 in our province. The first is to contain, which means detecting our cases as soon as possible. We are increasing our testing, doing active surveillance in hospitals, and testing for COVID-19 in all declared respiratory illness outbreaks in our long-term care homes. The second part of our approach is to, is to delay community transmission for as long as possible. Strategies to achieve this include the recommendations for voluntary self-isolation and we are doing aggressive contact tracing. 
And the third approach is to mitigate, which means preventing the spread of COVID-19 when it arrives here. To do this, we are educating and preparing our staff on what personal protective equipment to wear and how to care for those who are suspected of or have confirmed cases of COVID-19. And we are also aiming to dispel myths and rumors, basing our decisions on guidance from infectious diseases and infection prevention and control experts, and learning from those who've already been dealing with this around the world on a much larger scale. We wanna thank the public in particular for their support and patience as we work each day to adapt and respond to the changing health needs associated with this virus. At the same time, we are working hard to maintain safe care for all of our patients, clients, residents, and families so that our healthcare system is there when you need us, regardless of the circumstance. Now I'm gonna ask my colleague, Dr. Julie Krasinowski, to provide a few, a few comments on how the public can help and what you need to know. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Canada's Chief Public Health Officer and Saskatchewan's Chief Medical Health Officer assess the level of risk to people in Canada and Saskatchewan as low. What this means is that most people, more than 80%, who contract the virus do not become seriously ill and recover without specific treatment. However, we know it can cause serious illness in some people, especially those who are older or who have other health conditions. To date, two people have tested positive for the virus in Saskatchewan. Neither have required hospitalization. Both have traveled outside Saskatchewan before becoming ill. There is no evidence of community transmission in Saskatchewan at this time. Just like this virus affects individuals differently, it will not affect all of our communities in the same way. Our actual risk will depend on our strengths and weaknesses and our level of preparedness. There are measures you can take to protect yourself and your family, friends, and communities. Symptoms of COVID-19 include cough, fever, extreme fatigue. If you are sick, please stay home, cover your coughs and sneezes, and refer to the information that's available and it will be updated as more information becomes available. Individuals can take measures to protect themselves by practicing good personal hygiene. Wash your hands frequently, avoid touching your hands to your face, practice social distancing, and avoid non-essential travel. The Chief Medical Health Officer announced yesterday public health measures to prevent community transmission. These include restricting large gatherings of people and avoiding visits to long-term care in hospitals for 14 days after traveling outside the province. We also need to take other measures to stay well. It is even more important now to care for your physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. Eat well, stay active, take time to rest. Maintain a daily routine and manage stress in healthy ways. While social distancing can prevent transmission, we also need to make sure we maintain social connections and support and care for those who are vulnerable. We want people to receive the health care they need in the right place at the right time. Testing is available to people who have symptoms and risk factors. This includes travel outside Canada, people hospitalized with a respiratory illness, outbreaks in long-term care, and contacts of cases. Because there is no vaccine and no, and no specific treatment, everyone is at some risk. To manage our healthcare resources, we must act now to prevent community transmission and reduce peak burden on the healthcare system. SHA is working together to improve health and well being every day for everyone. This global pandemic will continue for the weeks and months to come. We're all in this together. And my message to the people of Saskatchewan today is to take care of yourself and each other. Thank you. So we'll now take questions. Um, I am going to uh, ask for questions in the room first. I believe we have people on video on uh, teleconference as well. So we'll, we'll wait till we exhaust the questions in the room before we start the teleconference questions. So uh, we'll take our first question here. Global News. Are the ERs in Saskatoon still at lower capacity? I don't think I have the numbers in front, but uh, we've been looking at the capacity numbers. It's not the ERs that are over capacity. We do know that our tertiary care centers in Saskatoon are running at full capacity and above capacity. 
Um, it's even more important uh, that we've been doing the work purposefully over the past uh, few months and years to try to improve the access to care outside of the hospitals so that our, our hospitals can be running more as efficiently as possible. Um, and that's an important part of the messaging around testing. We want to make sure that testing is available in the community rather than directing people to emergency departments for testing. Another question? Over here, sorry. Do we, uh, do we know how many people have been tested besides the people that have uh, been confirmed? Has there been any other cases? So the surveillance numbers are posted every day on the Ministry of Health website. They're updated daily at 5 p.m. They include the numbers of tests as well as the numbers that have been reported positive. Has the Saskatchewan Health Authority been in contact with any of the individuals who maybe have been in contact with the two positive cases at this point in time? Um, it's my understanding that there maybe was uh, some community engagement with one of the individuals. Um, has, has the SHA been in contact with anybody who had maybe come in contact with these two cases at this point in time? Yes, that's part of what is called the contact investigation. So when a person is under investigation um, or has tested positive for COVID-19, um, then public health, um, which is part of the SHA, would initiate a contact investigation, which means following up with that person to identify who they've been in close contact with. It often includes household contacts, but may include community contacts as well. And then public health will make arrangements to get in touch with those people to determine whether or not they have symptoms and then to arrange for the necessary testing. Is there any idea about how many people at this point in time are going to yeah, those numbers are being updated on a, a routine basis, regular basis. That is the day-to-day -day work of public health. Fortunately, I don't have a number for you, but um, that work is ongoing. Another question, my apologies. When it comes to those who are self-isolating and those who are helping those who are self-isolating, you know, what would your guidance be for individuals who are maybe bringing groceries or bringing supplies to people who are in self-isolation? Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Um, what I would recommend um, is to maintain social distancing measures. So that means staying one meter apart. Um, so if you are helping somebody out in that way, um, that's terrific. This is what we need to do as a community. We need to pull together and help each other out, our friends and neighbors. Um, but if you are dropping things off for somebody who is um, self-isolating at home, um, suggest that you could drop it off on the doorstep um, rather than making direct physical contact with the person who is self-isolating. Is there Come any on. Uh, potential timeline right now for when events might start to resume a little bit more when uh, the 250 person limit might sort of be protected? I think that would be a decision of government. Uh, I probably could get Julie to con give some context as to what goes into that decision. but. So um, if somebody has questions about um, what this means for an event that's being planned for their community, um, we would encourage them to review um, the direction that is provided um, with this Chief Medical Health Officer order. Um, and if it isn't clear, or if they do have questions, um, to consult with their local medical health officer who can help them with a the risk assessment. Um, a lot of it depends on who would be attending that event. Um, so certainly, um, if people are traveling within the province versus from outside the province, that's one um, of the factors. But also, if the people attending the event are vulnerable in any way. So if it is an event for older adults or whether people um, might have um, other health conditions that put them at risk, all of that can be part of the, the consideration. Um, and beyond the um, health considerations, there's obviously other um, uh, things to, to factor in when making a decision. So that's all part of the overall um, risk assessment and a decision of who's organizing the event. So we can't provide any updates on individual cases. Um, this is obviously protection of personal privacy. Um, and if we do contact uh, uh, contacts of confirmed cases, we wouldn't be providing um, the names of the person that they've been in contact with, um, also to protect personal privacy. Is there any sort of communication between the Saskatchewan Health Authority and the Christ House School and the Health staff on the future of this point in time? And if so, what I don't think we could comment at that level of specificity. Can I ask to see if anybody else has any questions? I was wondering about sort of uh, per, uh, personal protection and uh, stuff for nurses and doctors. I think we were hearing from the nurses union yesterday wondering about sort of um, getting sort of regular masks instead of proper respirators just sort of, uh, I guess, what will frontline healthcare workers be able to do? But 
Yeah, I'll ask Dr. Shaw to no. probably comment on that. So safety is uh, top of mind for all of us, for everybody, including all of our staff, including our nurses. And that's why we have a solid per personal protective equipment or PPE guidelines that we have in place, including uh, preparation with equipment and then training and maintenance, uh, making sure that our staff are using the equipment appropriately. Uh, we do know that our guidelines are completely in alignment with both the World Health Organizations and the Public Health Agency of Canada's uh, recommendations based on their understanding of the evidence. And that's what we have both within all of the provincial and within the Saskatchewan Health Authority policies and practices. Um, using the right equipment for the right procedure and the right pa patient is incredibly important. And uh, for those that are um, working every day uh, frontline, including me, uh, uh, it's very important I'm using the right equipment the right way. And for uh, almost all situations, that is a face shield, a medical procedure mask, gloves, and a gown. And of course, using the appropriate technique to both put them on and off, or what we call donning and doffing. The masks that the uh, nurses union were referring to and that we're getting a lot of questions about both be before that and, and during this situation is the uh, availability of the N95 mask. These are very specific masks. Uh, you'll have heard much about them uh, all around the world. Uh, you need to be specially fitted for and trained on how to use them. And we also know that they only need to be used in very specific situations, which are uh, situations where a patient might need an end a breathing tube inserted to have them uh, be on a ventilator or very specific other procedures in a medical situation. That's not the routine everyday care of these patients, um, but it is important that we have the N95s available, and we do, for all staff when they do need them. Are you worried about uh, any possible shortages, I guess, of any of these supplies? Well, that's exactly why we need to make sure we're using the right equipment at the right time so that we can ensure that the uh, supply chain is maintained. Uh, we are watching and monitoring that on an uh, active basis. It's more than daily. And we're working with our suppliers to ensure that we have access to the right um, equipment. This is a worldwide situation, though, and we know that this has put stressors on the supply chains all around the world for these particular types of equipment. And that's why, important that, why, that's why it's so important that we uh, use those pieces only at the right time. I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add, Derek? Um, I will say that we have placed the bulk order for a number of uh, key um, pieces of uh, uh, personal protective equipment like masks and gowns and, and so on. Um, and I'll just give an example. We typically order um, about 230,000 procedural masks every month across the, the Health Authority and we put in an order to account for six months worth, so about 1.4 million uh, masks. Um, so that order has been placed but it is being prioritized. Again, globally there's a lot of demand for this kind of uh, um, supplies um, and in the interim we are um, preparing for any if we were to have any potential sh shortages with uh, with the contingency plans. I believe that's just what Dr. Shaw spoke to but I'll let her let her speak to that yeah. a little more specifically so we, yeah. this includes the Tracy well, I, we actually had a um, conversation with uh, uh, the president of Sun and uh, one of their senior staff yesterday. A uh, small team of us met with them by phone through WebEx, and we had a good conversation. I think we have a shared um, prioritization of safety for all of our staff and including our nurses. Uh, we all care about safety for all. And uh, we, we talked through some of the uh, alignment in our positions and that we, uh, we are seeing uh, a difference between what they're recommending and what the World Health Organization is recommending. And our policies and procedures align with the World Health Organization. I look forward to ongoing conversations about how we can better plan together and have the information available um, so that they can be reassured as well. But I am comfortable and, and I am using the same guidelines that our nurses are using and I will be uh, limiting my use of N95 masks to only those situations that my patients and I require. Are there plans to follow the sun recommendations moving forward? Not at this time. Uh, we're sticking with the World Health Organization and the Public Health Agency of Canada's recommendations as are the other provinces across the country. Okay. Yep, right here. Uh, for people that are, uh, that are exhi exhibiting symptoms and are wanting to get tested, what's the proper procedure? Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> um, so for people who have symptoms um, and a travel history, 
um, testing um, is available. Um, so there's different routes to testing. Um, one route is through Healthline, and we do experience, do understand that Healthline is experiencing um, its own issues um, with responding uh, to callers in a, in a timely way. But we ask for people's patience with that. Um, it is important um, to be um, assessed for whether or not a test is indicated. Um, the tests are important for surveillance purposes. We do need to know what's out there in the community. We do not need to understand what's happening in terms of, of community transmission. Um, but for many people, it won't actually change um, how their symptoms are managed. Um, so it's important if you do have symptoms and you think you might be at risk, um, that you continue to self-isolate at home um, and then um, make arrangements for the testing, either through Healthline. Um, people can also call their family physicians and have family physicians uh, provide a referral to a testing center by phone um, or if they visit the family uh, physician or um, if need be a hospital, they can also be referred to the testing centers as well. We opened, uh, as, as you mentioned, Saskatoon Regina each have a testing site that opened yesterday. We are planning to open a, a third testing site in Prince Albert on Monday. Um, and we are continuously uh, assessing um, whether additional testing sites would be required in any of those centres or also in, uh, in other locations across the province. Testing is also available outside of the assessment centres. So for those who live in Saskatoon, Regina, and starting on Monday, Prince Albert, um, assessment centres will be available as one of their options. Uh, but the rest of the province, uh, while we wait to assess where else testing centres might need be necessary, can get and have been getting the testing done locally, whether it be through um, their local medical health officer. We've had some tests done at homes. We've had tests done all across the province. So they don't need to travel at this time. More, any more questions? I, I have one kind of a new question. So it seems as though there's been kind of a lot of back and forth between the provincial political parties here in the province when it comes to COVID. Is the, the politics of it interfering with the response at all? Not within the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Um, we're working very closely in collaboration with our colleagues within ministry and uh, taking direction from the chief medical health officer as we do and it should. And our planning is going along, I think, quite well. And uh, this is what we do in healthcare. We we work to coordinate care across the entire province. Right here. I haven't checked in the last couple hours, I suppose, but I just uh, was hearing more problems with the A one one number this morning. Just wondering uh, sort of what the situation is there. Maybe any more problems? Yeah. So we're actively addressing the situation. As you know, this has been an unprecedented challenge that other jurisdictions have had the same challenge, and so uh, we haven't been. Uh, uh, avoid it. We haven't uh, been separate from that. It's it's occurred and challenge. We've had challenges as well, but we are making uh, significant inroads in uh, ramping up to address capacity. So by Friday morning, we had already more than doubled staff. Uh, we had already doubled the IT capacity of the phone line to actually take calls. We've tripled that by this morning, and we actually should by the end of this weekend be able to hold unlimited calls. We know that even doubling staffing is not going to be enough. We're going to continue to ramp up staffing in this area. So uh, I think uh, we've definitely acknowledged we've had challenges. Other provinces have, to, have had challenges as well. But we're actively working at, uh, at addressing them. Yeah. How does this compare to the I wasn't around for 2009, so maybe I'll ask somebody who was. Well, I, I was, and uh, there's been lots of comparisons between COVID-19 and H1N1. They are two very different viruses, and I think they are two very different um, situations. H1N1, um, I remember the planning well, and we had the benefit at that time of always being able to look to the other half of the world. It travels around the world in a, in a cycle. Um, and using the you know, year by year knowledge to be able to plan and prepare. The other thing that's very different is H1N1 has, uh, or influenza has an immunization available for it and uh, actually had, has some antiviral treatments that can help support recovery. What's sa the same though? So they're two very different viruses. What's, what's, uh, what's this is the same is the importance of having uh, good planning processes 
And uh, I do think and I know that having single health authority has made it much more easier, uh, not easy, but easier to coordinate planning. Um, we don't have to have 12 representatives from 12 regions. We're able to do that just as a single health authority. So it's uh, improved, I think, the planning and the logistics. Um, but it is, there are two very different viruses. Uh, H1N1, though, still does teach us a lot about how to be prepared, what to anticipate, what comes next, and uh, what to keep our eyes on. Any more questions? Back to the back. Yeah, a lot of businesses like restaurants and stuff are, are really struggling right now. Um, should people be avoiding going out to places like this, or is it, is it still a little bit too early to tell people to not patronize these places? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Should we speak yeah. to that? So at this time, um, there's no evidence that there is community transmission in Saskatchewan. Um, so that recommendation is not being recommended widely. Um, for people who do have risk factors, so um, whether because of being of older, older age or underlying health conditions where they are concerned about being in a place where somebody else might be sick, not just for COVID-19, but for other reasons as well, um, those are measures that they can take to protect themselves. Um, so what we would advise people is to continue, continue with your daily routine, but do pay attention to personal hygiene. So if you're sick, stay at home, um, cover your coughs and sneezes, avoid going to work, avoid going out in public. Um, and uh, for people who want to protect themselves, hand hygiene is really, really important. Um, you can maintain social distancing. Um, you can also choose to avoid places where there are l large gatherings um, as a way to protect yourself. It, it is, and I can't. I'm not a technical expert on the technology, but right now, uh, we can we can hold up to a hundred calls at a time. Uh, we have plans over this weekend to make that unlimited, so somebody can stay on, so we don't no longer have that drop call problem. So, yeah. Thank you. For yeah. So you mentioned you had plans for epidemics in place, and now, or I should say, now we have one. Do you have a capacity or numbers you're preparing for to see through the? The Part of pandemic planning is looking at scenarios, and some of this information is on the Saskatchewan website, I believe, but right now we're in the first stage. Um, but we do run scenarios between, you know, what, what, what happens if we have one patient, 10 patients, 100 patients, 1,000 patients, what does that look like? And that's part of um, all pandemic plans is um, making that modeling and scenario planning, and that's part of the work that we do. We've been doing in the past and we're continuing to do. So far we only have two and there's no community transmission as you say. Is there a, a, a spike level that would uh, put a lot of stress in our systems? Or, or like, I guess it would be our um, infection curve. Mm -hmm. uh, would, what sort of steepness of that curve would cause you to be concerned? I don't know if we have a, I don't, it's a good question. I don't know if I have a good answer. I think what we do know is it's a very important to try and flatten and delay that curve as much as possible so that the healthcare system doesn't become overwhelmed. The scenario uh, modeling that uh, the teams within the health authority and within ministry are doing helps uh, model out and prepare for such scenarios. And I, I don't have the exact numbers available, um, but uh, any surge, and we've seen this before, even outside of pandemic planning, when we do see sudden increases in people presenting for care, we are able to uh, plan, respond, uh, delay care for others and so I know some healthcare systems are looking at things like when should elective surgeries be delayed uh, when should clinics for non-emergent care be delayed those are things we consider but we're not at that point right now I anticipate though if we did see more numbers and we saw more people at this point we've got nobody admitted to hospital with a confirmed case if that were to change then we would have to of course adjust all of our plans I would maybe just add to that that um, as part of the, the ongoing planning and the updates to uh, the specific COVID-19 uh, uh, situation, we are using the modeling at the provincial level to, to project and, and predict what resources will be required and, and where. And then also we're, we're cascading that down to the facility level so they will be able to um, understand based on different volumes what the, what the demands would be at their particular hospitals and facilities. Got a question here. There are a lot of myths about the COVID-19 virus out there. What are some of them that you'd like to contest right now? There's a lot. Uh, do you have an example? Uh, I'm not, well, not sure. Do you, have you heard any that you... I think the one that um, 
I would really like to put out there is that a lot of people are trying to sell supplements as solutions and there are no supplements that will treat and I think that's actually um, very unethical and wrong to be trying to monetize uh, what is a unfolding and at times uh, anxiety provoking situation and so there are at this time no known treatments that uh, or supplements or alternate therapies that offer anything other <laughs> than anything they don't they don't help um, what does help is taking care of yourself self-isolating excellent hand hygiene avoiding large groups if you're large you know large collections of people if that's what you're worried about and uh, good supportive care inside hospitals when necessary so I'm mindful of time as well so maybe we could do two, two more questions in the room and then on to the phone so here uh, should people be stocking up on anything how much toilet paper is <laughs> <laughs> I don't, We did not bring a toilet paper expert to the uh, media <laughs> conference, uh, but I'll ask. Sure, I'll, I'll try to respond to that. Um, so because COVID-19 is new, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fear about what might happen. A lot of that fear is driven by um, what um, other people see other people doing. Um, I think it's important uh, to have um, for every household a plan that has at least a 72 hour supply of all of the essential things that you need. I think people need to plan um, for the event that they may be um, required to self isolate at home for a 14 day period and have a plan in place for what that looks like. Um, I know that uh, when people are out shopping there are shortages of things that they think they need on the shelves. Um, it's important that you do have access to soap and water because that's what you need to wash your hands. Hand sanitizer is um, something that can be used, but it's not necessary to maintain good hand hygiene. Um, it's also important um, that people are thinking about um, their neighbors and their family and friends who might need help um, if they were to be um, self-isolating at home and have a plan um, to support uh, the social connections as well. So that's what I would recommend right now, people get ready for. So I'm gonna break my own rules because I think two more, I saw two more, so I'm gonna go with you and then you and then we'll go to the... Routine doctors not being able to provide service over the phone and potentially by video, can the FHA have an estimate on how many physicians and homes are gonna be able to provide video services for next week? I don't think we do. Uh, we, we, um, we do have telehealth suites available within the health authority and we are um, are looking at uh, how to ramp that up and convert um, in-person clinic visits to uh, virtual ones. We also have many physicians that are already doing this with their patients on a routine basis. Mm -hmm. yep. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we also know that uh, phone conversations are a good way that many patients can stay connected with their physicians and uh, I know that the SMA and Ministry of Health have worked on creating a uh, uh, fee code that supports that as a uh, option for patients and their physicians and I also know that many physicians are we're actively already uh, working through how to do that for their patients. So again, I think that uh, Dr. Krasinowski could speak to some of the factors around that, but ultimately that would be a, go a decision of the government uh, and the chief medical health officer. But I'll, I'll let Julie, if she has any context, provide around the decision. Sure. So all of the medical health officers in the province are working very closely with the provincial chief medical health officer. Um, with respect to school closures, because of what is happening in other parts of the country, that's obviously something that... Um, we're thinking about. Um, it's not a plan at this time, um, but it is something that we are thinking about and making plans for um, if and when it becomes necessary in the province. Okay, I'd like to give a chance for anybody who's calling in on the line and we just have to have a quick technical fix here. And uh, can those on the line hear me? And I'll uh, just see. Okay, uh, any questions from the line? Where it, where it will be located? 
So the uh, the testing site in PA will be set up on Monday, um, and the location of it isn't. We're not disclosing the locations of the testing sites just for patient uh, privacy. Um, so the access is, is similar to what was mentioned earlier through a one one Healthline or by contacting your family physician's office um, by phone for a referral. The turnaround test, the turnaround time on the test is between one to two days, uh, so which is um, quite impressive. <laughs> and you don't need a doctor's note um, in terms of you having a physical note. You do need a referral to a testing center, which can be done either through 811 Healthline or through your family physician or nurse practitioner's office. Um, they don't need to see you in person. They can do an assessment by phone using an algorithm and then generate a referral that will be uh, sent over to the testing site. Any, uh, okay. Who was that that answered my question? That's Susan Shaw. Okay. Um, I just have a couple more questions here. Um, can, can someone explain why um, schools in Saskatchewan have not been uh, cancelled at, at this point, seeing as how the Ontario schools um, have? Sorry, again, I think you'd have to direct that question uh, on the actual decision to the Ministry of Health because it's their Chief Medical Health Officer who would make that call. Okay. Uh, okay, two more questions here. Um, so, I'm just wondering, can the casino and big hall in PA continue to have gatherings of over 250 uh, people now that it's banned? I think I would defer. Do you have a comment on that, Julie? Um, so the provincial chief medical health officer um, yesterday announced the public health measures that are intended to prevent community transmission. So those include restricting large gatherings of people. Um, so what that means to individual communities and events that are being planned in communities is something um, that needs to be assessed based on that order, um, but that is the direction um, and order from the Provincial Chief Medical Health Officer. Okay, okay um, that Dr. Shaw? Sorry, that was... Who answered my question again? That, no, that was Dr. Krasnowski. Uh, is anybody else in the phone okay. line? Can we go just give a chance for anybody else in the phone line to ask questions? Uh, yeah, uh, Jason Kerr with the Prince Albert Daily Herald. I know you guys talked a little bit about uh, additional testing sites or potentially setting up more in the future. We are uh, the the leaders in the, that are responsible for the northern locations. They are assessing what their needs are uh, in terms of testing. So that's something that they're they're examining right now and looking at different options to ensure that that um, they're able to provide that service. That was Derek Miller, our EOC lead. Any other questions on the line? Uh, I just have one more question. Sorry, um, where are you I'm calling? Call in from Sorry, where are you Sorry. calling from? Uh, this is Ian from PA, from PA now again. Okay, oh, thanks. Uh, I, just, I just have one more question here. Um, the, I got a call from the Victoria Hospital this morning um, saying that there's restricted, um, restricted visiting in the maternity and No, I believe it's unrelated, but I'll... I, I believe it's unrelated. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for coming today. I really appreciate you attending and uh, for questions. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.